September 1942, in the shattered villages of North Africa, British infantry crouched behind sandbag walls, watching German panzer IVs roll forward like moving fortresses. Their boys' rifles and two-pounder guns barked, but the shells bounced off the enemy armor like stones against a locomotive. To many soldiers, it felt like suicide to stand their ground. The Wehrmacht's tanks seemed unstoppable, until a new, almost laughably small-looking weapon arrived at the front. Its barrel looked thin, its frame light enough to drag by hand, yet within weeks of its debut, this toy gun, as some called it, had earned a chilling reputation. The German crews began to fear it. The British called it the six-pounder, officially the Ordnance QF six-pounder, a lightweight anti-tank gun that would prove itself capable of destroying the heaviest armor Germany ever fielded. It wasn't supposed to be this way. In the early years of the war, Britain's anti-tank doctrine lagged dangerously behind. Military planners still imagined slow-moving, thin-skinned tanks like those of 1918. The two-pounder gun, designed before the war, could penetrate early Panzer models. But when the Germans unleashed thicker armor and slope designs, British gunners suddenly found themselves outmatched. The result was panic and improvisation. Soldiers mounted two-pounders on trucks, on carriers, even on makeshift carriages just to give them mobility. But it wasn't enough. By 1941, the War Office knew that if Britain didn't produce a new gun and fast, its armies would be slaughtered by steel. Design work had begun before the crisis fully hit. Engineers at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich had quietly been experimenting with a larger weapon since 1938. The problem was timing. Manufacturing the gun required new tooling and new carriages, and Britain in 1940 was fighting for its life. The fall of France forced the government to focus every available resource on defending the island. As a result, production of the six-pounder was postponed. Thousands of two-pounders continued to roll off the lines because the factories were already set up for them. It was a painful compromise that would cost lives in the desert. When the six-pounder finally entered service in 1942, gunners were desperate for it. And within days of its first battle, they knew this was the weapon they'd been waiting for. The first real test came at Gazala. The desert sun burned down over the Libyan sands as British and Commonwealth forces faced Rommel's Africa Corps. The German tanks advanced with terrifying confidence, their armor glinting in the heat haze. Then, hidden among the dunes, a handful of newly issued six-pounders opened fire. The recoil was sharp but controlled. The small gun spat a 57mm shell at almost twice the velocity of the older two-pounder. In seconds, the leading panzer erupted in smoke. Another followed. German crews were caught off guard. No one expected such a compact weapon to slice through the frontal armor of their tanks. Within days, word spread across the desert. The British had a new sting in their tail. The gun's appearance was deceptive. Its slim profile and narrow trail legs made it easy to underestimate, but this was deliberate. At just under 2,500 pounds, it was light enough for a small crew to manhandle into position, hide behind low cover, and vanish again after firing. In the wide-open battlefields of North Africa, that agility saved lives. The Germans called it a ghost gun, because it seemed to appear, strike, and disappear before counterfire could be directed. More than its size or weight, it was the balance of mobility and power that made it revolutionary. The six-pounder could pierce over 80 millimeters of armor at 500 meters, enough to punch through a Panzer IV's thickest plate. Its success didn't come from luck alone. British engineers had refined the gun with obsessive precision. They used a long L-50 barrel that gave the projectile higher muzzle velocity and flatter trajectory, meaning the gunners didn't have to guess at distance as much as before. The ammunition itself was redesigned too. The armor-piercing capped ballistic shell maintained its shape on impact, biting through the metal rather than shattering. Forward observation officers quickly learned that two or three well-placed shots from a six-pounder could halt a German armored column in its tracks. In North Africa, where every tank mattered, that meant turning battles. For the first time since the war began, British infantry felt they could fight on equal terms. The six-pounder had restored something beyond firepower, it restored confidence. And in war, that could be just as lethal as steel. When the fighting shifted to Europe, the six-pounder followed. By 1943, 
It was mounted not only on towed carriages but also inside British armored vehicles like the Churchill and Valentine tanks. The same lightweight weapon that infantrymen had dragged through sand was now being fired from steel giants on the move. In Sicily and later in Italy, the gun proved it could handle steep hills, narrow roads, and mud-slicked fields as easily as it had handled the desert. Soldiers joked that it was the little gun that never complained. When the larger 17-pounder began arriving, many gunners still preferred their six-pounders. They trusted it. It fired fast, rarely jammed, and its accuracy under pressure became legendary. But the gun's reputation was truly cemented in the summer of 1944 in Normandy. When Allied forces stormed ashore on D-Day, hundreds of six-pounders were landed with them. The weapon's low silhouette made it ideal for beach defenses and ambush positions hidden behind hedgerows. German counterattacks came hard and fast, spearheaded by panthers and tigers whose thick armor had terrified crews across Europe. Yet the British gunners didn't flinch. They trained for this. When a Tiger tank rumbled down a Norman lane, its commander certain no British gun could hurt him, a well-camouflaged six-pounder fired a single shot into the turret ring. The shell penetrated, igniting ammunition inside. The massive tank stopped dead. It wasn't just luck. It was skill, discipline, and the gun's uncanny precision. The six-pounder's armor penetration was boosted even further by new ammunition introduced that same year. The APDS, or armor-piercing discarding sabot round. Instead of a full-caliber shell, it fired a smaller, denser core at blistering speed. The result was devastating. Tests showed the sabot round could pierce up to 110 millimeters of armor, enough to kill a tiger from the side or disable it from the front with a perfect hit. German reports began referring to the British anti-tank defenses as unexpectedly effective. That phrase, in the cautious language of military intelligence, was a quiet admission of fear. For the British soldier crouched behind the breech of a six-pounder, each hit meant survival. Each plume of black smoke rising from an enemy tank meant one more day alive in the Bocage country of Normandy. The six-pounder became an artist's weapon, one of patience, timing, and nerve. The dense hedgerows, thick with earth and roots, created a battlefield unlike anything the British had faced before. Tanks couldn't see beyond a few yards. Infantry advanced blind into green walls of death. For anti-tank gunners, that chaos became an opportunity. They learned to dig shallow pits just behind the hedgerows, concealing the gun's barrel in the undergrowth. From there, they could wait, silent, invisible, until the clanking rumble of German armor crept closer. The first shot had to count. A single round through the tracks or under the turret could disable even a panther, turning its great weight into a prison of steel. The six-pounder's light recoil and easy traverse meant that repositioning between shots was quick. Crews could fire, shift a few feet, reload, and fire again before enemy gunners found their range. This agility often made the difference between life and death. In one after-action report from June 1944, a British lieutenant described engaging five German tanks at less than 300 yards. His battery destroyed for the fifth retreating in panic. None of his men were hit. The lieutenant credited the quick little six for the outcome. It wasn't only the gun's performance. It was the system built around it. British artillery doctrine emphasized coordination between forward observers, infantry commanders, and gun crews. When an enemy tank was spotted, positions could be plotted within seconds. The six-pounder's accuracy allowed close fire support that heavier guns couldn't risk. Infantry could advance knowing that their invisible partners just behind the lines could deliver surgical strikes. And when the war pressed eastward toward the Rhine, the six-pounder went with it, through shattered villages, frozen rivers, and fields littered with the burned-out carcasses of tanks. Though newer weapons like the 17-pounder and American 76mm took the spotlight, the smaller gun kept earning its reputation as a dependable killer. Even when facing the King Tiger, crews found ways to exploit its design flaws, aiming for tracks, vision ports, or turret rings. Against the heaviest armor Germany could build, Britain's lightweight gun still found a way to bite.by early 1945. The six-pounder had become more than a weapon. It was a symbol of British ingenuity under constraint. Its very creation had been born from scarcity, a lack of heavy industry, steel, and time. 
Yet, in those limitations, engineers had built a masterpiece of balance and purpose. Crews who once doubted its power now refused to fight without it. In the ruins of Cannes, the gun was dragged by hand through streets clogged with debris, firing at German snipers one moment and half-tracks the next. On the frozen banks of the Rhine, it fired across misty dawns as the British pushed deeper into the Reich. And when the war in Europe finally ended, the same small weapon that began as an emergency measure stood among the tools that had delivered victory. The six-bounder's design was simplicity perfected. Its breech operated smoothly, even under grime and frost, could be stripped and cleaned in minutes. The ammunition was light enough for rapid handling but lethal when it struck. Maintenance crews loved it because it never complained. Mud, dust, cold, or heat, the mechanism never faltered. Where larger guns demanded trucks and cranes, the six-pounder needed only men and courage. That portability meant it could follow the infantry everywhere, from Tunis to Arnhem, from the beaches of Sicily to the bridges of Germany, veterans would later say it had a personality. Quick-tempered but loyal. It rewarded discipline, punished haste. A careless aim wasted the chance. A steady hand brought thunder. Some called it the gentleman's gun, because success came from patience, not brute force. The Germans, meanwhile, learned to fear the distinctive crack of its shell. Tank crews reported the chilling clang of impact that often came just before their world turned to flame. Even after the surrender, the gun story didn't end. The British Army kept it in service for years. Commonwealth nations, Canada, India, Australia, trained generations of gunners on it. It was simple enough for new recruits to master, precise enough for veterans to trust. The same qualities that made it lethal in war made it invaluable in peace. Reliability, economy, and accuracy that never aged. The Six-Bounders' post-war life told its own quiet story of endurance. Across Europe, Asia, and Africa, former Commonwealth armies kept the gun in their arsenals long after newer models appeared. Its small frame fit the needs of nations rebuilding from ruin, cheap to operate, easy to train with, impossible to break. In Korea, British and Canadian crews dragged it up icy slopes where heavier weapons couldn't go. In the jungles of Malaya and Burma, it fired blind through trees to protect patrols under ambush. Decades later, it still turned up in colonial conflicts and border wars, always the same trusted silhouette. Squat, lean, deadly. What began as a stopgap had outlived the empire that built it. Historians often ask how such a modest design could endure through generations of technological change. The answer lies not in size or power, but in purpose. The six-pounder did exactly what it was meant to, nothing more, nothing less. It struck the balance every soldier understands instinctively, powerful enough to matter, simple enough to survive. Engineers who designed it under budget cuts could never have imagined it firing into the 1960s, but their pragmatism gave it immortality. Every bolt, spring, and barrel thread reflected an era when Britain's strength came from resourcefulness rather than wealth. Even today, restored six-pounders appear at reenactments and museums across the world. Veterans touch the metal as if greeting an old friend. To them, it isn't just a weapon. It's a memory of comrades, of knights under shellfire, of that single breath between aiming and recoil. Its bark once echoed across deserts and forests, defying tanks that were supposed to be invincible. The irony is beautiful. A weapon dismissed as too light ended up shaping the outcome of battles against the heaviest armor mankind had ever built in the end. The six-pounder stands as proof that innovation is often born from desperation. When Britain lacked everything money, materials, time, it built something perfect in its simplicity. Against the thunder of tigers and panthers, it whispered precision. And that whisper, multiplied thousands of times across continents, became one of the clearest voices of Allied victory.